So thank you, Filippo. Thank you to all the uh, IOT, the Italian Association for Thoracic Oncology. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today, also if now I am in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we, we are going to start a very important part uh, of, uh, of the session. I think that there is a great unmet need on how to continue after the first generation uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. There are a lot of drugs uh, on the pipeline and uh, I think that we are going to do an exciting uh, session. So it's my privilege to introduce, uh, first of all, Suresh Ramalingan. Suresh was appointed in these days uh, like the director of the cancer, the Emory Cancer Center in Atlanta, which is, uh, I can tell you from here, this is a very huge cancer center in the United States. So it, I think that we can celebrate also his success and it's a great pleasure to give him the word. The first presentation will be targeting the co-inhibitory and the co-stimulatory signal in, uh, after the immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, Suresh, can you hear us yes. and can you speak? I can, Hello. I can hear you. Thank you very much. Good morning. <laughs> can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. It's truly a honor and a pleasure to be with friends to speak uh, at this session. Uh, hopefully 2022, we will be in person. And uh, I'm going to be focusing on emerging strategies that specifically target co-inhibitory and co-stimulatory signals. You've heard in the previous session, the combinations that are effective in the treatment of non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, let's talk about what's down the road uh, that we need to keep our eyes out for. Uh, these are my disclosures. So on this slide, I show you a working model of how we think about uh, immune checkpoint inhibition as to how it's working specifically PD-1, PD-L1 uh, blockade. Uh, this is a paper we published about three years ago. So when you talk about exhausted T cells, there is at least uh, broadly two groups of cells in there. One are what we call on the green color here, the stem-like CD8 T cells. These cells are the critical piece. They're the ones that proliferate and actually provide effector characteristics in the differentiated cells. And then these orange looking cells, these are terminally differentiated cells. They're exhausted, they are there, uh, but they are full of inhibitory receptors and their effector function uh, is uh, present, but they are not able to proliferate anymore. So these cells are already proliferated, terminally differentiated. The business end of the immune system here is these stem-like CD8 T cells. And when we give PD-1 inhibition, we're actually causing proliferation of the stem-like CD8 T cells they self-renew, and they also move into terminally differentiated cells, which have the effector functions. So you want both of these to happen for a patient to have a good response to immunotherapy. And in fact, within the first dose of PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibition, uh, by week two or week three, if you look at the patient's blood samples, you can look at these T cells and you can sense proliferation very early on. And we've shown that if you don't see this T cell proliferation, within three weeks of therapy, those patients are not likely to respond to immune checkpoint inhibition. Uh, there are now a number of strategies that are available for us to improve the effectiveness of immune checkpoint blockade. You heard about CTLA-4 blockade with PD-1 in the previous session. Uh, on the top of this pie, you can see uh, other strategies that are out there, co-stimulatory molecules, uh, working on inhibitory signals, Another area that's very exciting is cytokine modulation. Using cytokine-based approaches can actually improve the quality of T-cell response. So when we give immunotherapy and we're uh, seeing T-cells proliferate, we want two different aspects of T-cell proliferation. One, we want the quantity of the T-cells to go up. The second is you want the quality of the T-cells to improve. And our data show that when we give PD-1 inhibition, even when we get a good quantitative response, the quality, the transcriptional program of the proliferating cells is not quite as well as it can be to provide effective uh, or uh, lethal effector responses. So we really need to focus on improving the quality of the T-cell response by adding something on top of PD-1 inhibition. 
Uh, what I'm going to show you are a few approaches where we are seeing strategies uh, take place in the clinic. This is a figure that you are all very familiar with. These are the variety of checkpoints that are in play in antigen recognition, immune response, and subsequent anti-tumor effectiveness. And in this, you can see the inhibitory checkpoints and the stimulatory checkpoints uh, denoted by the minus sign or the plus sign on the right side of your slide. So uh, if you need uh, uh, to stimulate uh, a tumor's immune microenvironment, you can either promote the stimulatory signal or turn off the inhibitory signal. And some patients tumors are rich in inhibitory signals. Some patients tumors are lacking in stimulatory signals. So understanding the specific tumor microenvironment of a given patient may help us tailor appropriate strategies. And I think that's where the field is moving, but we're not there yet uh, at this point. So let me start off with a strategy that's been in the clinic where we've seen some data. This is TIGIT. Uh, TIGIT is uh, a checkpoint that uh, binds to the poliovirus receptor and uh, causes uh, inhibition. Uh, there are antibodies now that inhibit the ability of TIGIT to bind with its receptor. And in preclinical models, these combinations of anti-TIGIT and anti pdl antibodies have synergistic improvement in tumor control. And based on these uh, we have now uh, results from a randomized phase two study. That is the cl clinical design of the Cityscape trial where patients with advanced stage disease were given either a TZO plus placebo or a TZO plus tirogolumab. And the co-primary endpoints for this phase two trial were response rate and progression-free survival. 135 patients were enrolled. They stratified patients based on pdl one expression level, high versus low. And when you look at the overall patient population for response rates in the ITT population, there is a numerically better response rate with the combination of anti-TIGIT plus uh, atezolizumab compared to atezo alone. However, almost all of this difference is in the patient population with very high pdl one expression, greater than 50%. In the pdl one 1 to 49 group, there was no difference in response rates. How about progression-free survival? Here you see the high pdl one expressing group, the combination looks better compared to atezo plus placebo. Uh, one point I would make is the atezo group in this uh, study seemed to underperform with the median PFS of four months. We would expect it to be much better than four months in a high pdl one group. But regardless, it's a randomized trial. There is a favorable signal for the combination. When you look at the one to 49% group, there is no difference between the two arms of the trial. So this combination is now in a phase three clinical trial, specifically for the PDL1 high patients, greater than 50% uh, in the frontline therapy setting. Uh, now, uh, what about safety with this combination? The good news is there were no major safety signals. If you look at the grade three to five adverse events for the combination versus atezo monotherapy, uh, the numbers were practically similar. So this combination is tolerated well and seems to have a signal in the high PDL1 expressing group. This is a partial list of ongoing trials that target digit plus PD-1 inhibition in non-small cell lung cancer. There's also a trial in small cell lung cancer that looks at chemo plus atezo plus the anti-digit antibody. Uh, these trials are currently ongoing. Some of them are enrolling patients. To my knowledge, uh, none of them have completed accrual. So this one of the any one of these trials will provide us with the definitive information on how anti-digit strategy fits in, in lung cancer. Now let's talk about LAG3, which is another checkpoint. This uh, activation of LAG3 has been linked with resistance to PD-1 blockade. And the ligand for LAG3 is fibrinogen-like protein 1, FGL1. Uh, this uh, is elevated in patients treated with anti-PD-1 therapy uh, in those with poor outcomes. So uh, there is uh, biological rationale beyond what you see on the slide to block lag and PD-1 at the same time. Uh, this is a study that was done in melanoma, just proof of principle, looking at uh, patient population that uh, were enrolled. Uh, these are previously treated patients. When you look at the entire patient population, the combination of lag three and PD-1 inhibition was associated with a very modest 11% response rate. When you looked at it with patients who had lag three immunohistochemistry positivity, 
there the response rate was a little higher. In fact, when you uh, focus specifically on disease control rate, it was almost 65% for patients whose tumors expressed LAG3. So biomarker positive group here uh, seeing showing a favorable effect. Uh, this is uh, the scheme of an ongoing trial uh, combining NEVO plus a LAG3 inhibitor compared to NEVO alone in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, this is uh, a randomized phase two study that is ongoing. This provides a list of trials that target this particular approach, LAG plus PD-1 inhibition. Uh, these are studies that are enrolling at this point. You can see the number of companies that are developing their own anti-LAG3 uh, molecules. Uh, there are also studies in small cell uh, in this uh, list. Another uh, immune inhibitory checkpoint is TIM3. Uh, this uh, is a negative regulator. The ligands for this include CCAM1, uh, Galactin9, and others. And it has uh, an inhibitory effect on immune effectiveness. So uh, blocking TIM3 along with PD-1 inhibition is a very rational approach that's currently in clinical trials. These are some clinical trials that are ongoing. The first one is uh, NEVO plus BMS986258. This uh, has been recruiting patients for two to three years. We've not heard anything yet. Uh, the Tesaro molecule uh, is uh, uh, also being studied in multiple tumors. Responses have been seen in non-small cell lung cancer. There was presentation a couple of years ago. Uh, there are some other trials. The last one that you see, which is a bispecific TIM3 PDL1, was initially studied, but after 12 patients, uh, the development of this was discontinued. Now let's talk about co-stimulatory signals. We talked about inhibitory signals so far. OX40 is a co-stimulatory signal. It's a receptor of TNF. Uh, it's a member of the TNF receptor family. Uh, it is act it's present on activated CD4 and CD8 T cells. Uh, it uh, basically is turned on when CD28, another co-stimulatory signal, is engaged. Uh, it's also expressed in Treg. So uh, OX40 stimulation has been supported by preclinical rationale and is currently in clinical trials. In fact, there are a number of trials. <coughs> Excuse me. We saw a study uh, combining an OX40 agonist with a tezolizumab uh, back in 2016. Uh, that is no longer being developed, is my understanding, but uh, there are additional studies. There was a study in melanoma that uh, failed to show effectiveness for OX40 combination plus PD-1. Uh, to me, that is a little, of, a little bit of a red light. Uh, to see uh, where this will go, but certainly we have other studies that are ongoing that will hopefully educate us. Another co-stimulatory signal is 41BB. Uh, this uh, is uh, also referred to as CD137. We have actually clinical data from studies that look at 41BB agonist plus pembrolizumab. Uh, the uh, waterfall plot in a trial that was uh, looking at an antibody called utomilumab is shown. Uh, you can see that responses were seen, partial responses and complete responses. This includes patients with non-small cell lung cancer where partial response and stable disease are done. And in fact, I saw a study at uh, Dr. Garasino's institution that looks at combining 41BB with SBRT as a phase one trial at the University of Chicago. So uh, this is again an area that's rich. Uh, we're involved in a trial that uh, is a bispecific antibody targeting 41BB and PD-1 uh, that's being developed by GenMap. So a lot of activity that's ongoing in the 41BB uh, co-stimulatory uh, pathway. ICOS is another agonist. There are strategies now uh, stimulating ICOS. We've seen some clinical data with ICOS agonists in other diseases, not much in lung cancer so far. A number of phase one, phase two trials are ongoing. Uh, there is a phase two trial in Europe that specifically is for biomarker-selected non-small cell lung cancer patients. Uh, that uh, sounds very interesting. Now, lastly, I want to talk uh, briefly about multi-kinase inhibition. I know this doesn't specifically belong to the co-stimulatory or co-inhibitory uh, class, but there are uh, some interesting trials that are ongoing. This is cabazantinib, which is a multi-kinase inhibitor. It targets uh, a number of kinases, including VEGFR2, MET, and TAM family of receptors. 
as you can see, it has many important immune functions. It can cause increase in circulating uh, CD8 positive T cells. It re reduces Tregs. Uh, it also uh, blocks MET-induced expression of PDL1. So a number of ways by which uh, a multi-kinase inhibitor like cabozantinib could be effective. Uh, this is a study that's ongoing combining atezolizumab plus cabozantinib. This study compares the combination to docetaxel in the salvage therapy setting. These patients have progressed on prior PD-1 inhibition and platinum-based chemotherapy. And the primary endpoint for this trial will be overall survival. A trial we're doing at ECOG Akron, led by Dr. Joel Neal and Heather Bakley, is a, a phase two study in the second line and third line setting, where patients with prior immunotherapy are randomized to cabozantinib monotherapy or CABO plus NEVO versus standard of care in the control group. Uh, this is a randomized phase two study as well that's currently enrolling patients, building on our previous trial that showed cabozantinib to be quite effective in advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer as a single agent in unselected patient population. Another drug that I want to uh, bring your attention to is citravatinib. This is a multi-kinase inhibitor. This uh, is a study that combined citravatinib with nivolumab in patients with advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer. This was presented at WCLC and also the ESMO Congress. Uh, you can see the waterfall plot in patients who failed prior checkpoint inhibitor therapy, 32% uh, response rate, uh, and the waterfall plot showing nearly two out of three patients had some sign of clinical benefit in terms of reduction in tumor size. So this is interesting. There is a phase three trial that's actually completed approval. This is the SAFIRE trial. This is in the second line setting for patients with advanced stage disease. In fact, patients with second or third line are eligible. These patients uh, must have had some suggestion of benefit with prior PD-1 inhibition or PDL one inhibition, which means they should have remained on therapy for approximately at least four months. Uh, and after progression, they're randomized to either the control group of docetaxel or the experimental group of nivolumab plus citravatinib. The primary endpoint is overall survival. The trial has completed accrual to my knowledge, and uh, it uh, is planned for analysis sometime this year or early next year. So we'll keep our eyes out for this approach uh, in the upcoming days. I'm almost done. Lenvatinib is a multi-targeted tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's also in the same category of drugs we've talked about in cabozantinib and citravatinib. Uh, this is a combination trial, lenvatinib plus pembro. You can see the response rate of about 33% in uh, patients, including those who received prior immuno-oncology agents. So uh, there are combination trials that are currently ongoing. The LEAP trials are chemo plus pembro plus or minus lenvatinib. There's also a pembro plus or minus lenvatinib. Uh, so, uh, these trials are accruing uh, currently as we speak. Uh, notably in kidney cancer, there was a trial with Penbro plus Lenvatinib that appeared to show superiority over Sunitinib. So uh, hopefully these results will be favorable in lung cancer as well. So in conclusion, I hope I've been able to show you that there is strong rationale for targeting co-inhibitory and co-stimulatory molecules. There is a wealth of clinical trials that are ongoing. Uh, we hope to see uh, some of these uh, readouts in the upcoming month to a year. Uh, early outcomes, I would say, have been mixed, and the role of biomarkers are clearly critical in personalizing these combination approaches. I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you, Suresh, for the thorough presentation, and if you have time, we can leave the questions after the second presentation. Uh, the second presentation will be done by Fabrice Barlesi, Barle uh, and he is the chief medical officer in uh, Gustave Roussy. He's a friend, uh, and uh, he made a lot of work uh, also on trying to find biomarkers for the selection of patients to immunotherapy. I remember just the pioneer trial that was recently presented at ESMO. And uh, it's a pleasure for me. I give him the word for targeting the microenvironment. And then we can do a discussion in the end on the strategies to overcome the resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
Thank you, uh, Marina. And, uh, good to see uh, all you, all of you, friends. Uh, even if it's just virtually, but uh, as uh, all of you, I'm convinced that uh, next year we will be able to meet in Milano, and it will be a good pleasure to be to be there with you. Uh, yes, we are going from others to other situation. Then uh, uh, we don't have a lot of uh, of possibilities to uh, to treat patients resisting to CPI. Immune checkpoints are probably one of the most advanced uh, way and targeting the micro environment is just uh, at the beginning. Then um, here are my disclosures. Then first, uh, first of all, what is and what is in the micro environment? So the, the, the concept of the uh, mic tumor micro environment is an old concept that has been uh, revisited uh, quite uh, recently. Yeah, the story started uh, in the 19th century uh, when Virchow proposed the relationship between the inflammation and the cancer and Paget's uh, increased the theory with the, the fact that a cancer cell has to find a, a good environment to, uh, to, to develop. But the, the conventional concept is both based on, on the fact that it could be an initial mechanism that is the oncogenic mutations that is followed by a recruitment of the cells from the uh, tumoral microenvironment, which is favored by the hypoxia or the immunosuppression. But there is also some uh, hypothesis suggesting that, that a chronic inflammation in an abnormal tumor microenvironment may activate oncogenic signalings and promote tumorogenesis. More recently, we had the new concept, which is the tumor organismal environment, meaning that the microenvironments that influence the, the, the development of the cancer may be distant from the lesions, and it's especially uh, exemplified by the microbiota. We have uh, uh, two points of view, I would say. Uh, a first, maybe more classical histological point of view, where we can see that uh, the tumor microenvironment is uh, what remains when we uh, uh, extract the tumor cells, then we have the extracellular matrix, and we have on the other side all the cells that are in this uh, environment, with the uh, especially the vascularization. And we know that this neovascularization is probably uh, one of the important actors in the in the tumor microenvironment, but also all the lymphoids, the macrophage, and uh, uh, the, the fibroblast as an example. But we have also a more functional view of the microenvironment on the right. And it's illustrated by the fact that we have probably a lot of factors that influence this environment and that makes the, ta the therapeutic targeting of this microenvironment very difficult as hypoxia, uh, change in the metabolism, a change in the P pH of the, uh, of the microenvironment, the fact that cells are using the, uh, the nerves to, uh, to uh, disseminate, et cetera. Then what can, what can we, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, what are the, the potential strategy? Uh, I will go through these uh, different uh, uh, different uh, possibilities and show you uh, the very preliminary results that we have. As it has been said already by Suresh, VGF, VGF is probably one of the key uh, targets in the microenvironment. Uh, we know that uh, VGF is mediating immunosuppression by the inhibition of uh, DC maturation and antigen presentation, but also by favoring the cytotoxic uh, T-cells proliferation and infiltration. And also uh, uh, VGF is uh, uh, promoting an aberrant tumor vasculatures and also has a role regarding uh, the development of uh, immunosuppressive cells as T-Rex and uh, tumor associated uh, macrophage. Uh, it's illustrated uh, uh, in the figure uh, on the right. VGF has a role in every uh, place of the immune cycle. We have examples, uh, not in, uh, in, uh, in patients resisting to CPI, but we have examples uh, on how the combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors and VEGF inhibitors may act. And it's uh, specifically uh, uh, illustrated here uh, when, uh, talk, when looking at patients with uh, liver meds. And we will see that it may not just be, be by chance, uh, as probably a tumor associated macrophage uh, may influence uh, uh, maybe influenced by VGF inhibition. But if we look at the results of the IMPOR 150, and those results have been uh, published by Martin Reck uh, uh, two years ago, uh, if you look at uh, patients with liver meds, we have really a, a, a strong difference when 
uh, patients may receive a combination of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and VGF inhibitions compared to uh, immunotherapy alone. We have also data uh, in uh, uh, melanoma patients looking at uh, patients with uh, either BRAF mutated tumors or, or BRAF wild type tumor, and patients receive a combination of pembrolizumab and a VGFR TKI. Those results have been presented at ESMO last year. And you can see that even in this uh, highly pretreated patient population, the response rate was quite uh, interesting 21.4%, with uh, six months. Uh, uh, Response, uh, six, uh, of response at six months of 72%. Then I would say that uh, as uh, illustrated by the results presented by Suresh uh, Ramaningam, we, we can see that the combination of VGF inhibition with immunotherapy is probably uh, one of the way to try to control the, the tumor microenvironment in patients resisting to CPI. What about the tumor associated macrophage? Uh, Sometimes uh, infiltration is associated with uh, treatment resistance and poor clinical outcomes in the vast majority of the cancers. Uh, Tumor-associated macrophage promotes immune, immunosuppressions. And as I said, liver metastasis restrains uh, immunotherapy efficacy via uh, tumor-associated uh, macrophage-mediated med T-cell elimination, then making maybe uh, this uh, microenvironment highly specific. However, in addition, uh, tumor-associated macrophages are defective for tumor uh, phagocytosis, phagocytosis. If we look at the, the factors that influence the activity of tumor-associated macrophages, you can see a lot of uh, uh, factors that you know, like interleukin 10, the TGF beta, beta. But what is important also to have in mind is that uh, we really have a balance between the M2 tumor-associated macrophage that promote immunosuppression, but we have also uh, M1 tumor-associated macrophage uh, who are independent of CF1R that are promoting uh, uh, immune uh, stimulation. Then this is, there is a balance uh, for tumor-associated macrophage that is not so easy to target when looking at patients uh, resisting to CPI. Uh, However, if we see uh, the, the type of treatments that are under development uh, right now, you can see that they are, uh, they are targeting different uh, parts of the, the functions of the tumor-associated macrophages, either the polarization, as I said, uh, uh, TAM2 or TAM1, the phagocytosis uh, activity of the macrophages, the survival of the, of the macrophage or the recruitment of tumor cells by the macrophages. And you can see that the, 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 the type of targets that are uh, under investigation by different drugs and the, uh, the, the level of development of, uh, of these drugs. I just would like to show you uh, one example of uh, co-inhibition uh, uh, of uh, CD47 uh, and uh, CD20. Of course, it's not in an, in, uh, in the lung cancer model, it's uh, in uh, uh, large uh, B uh, lymphoma model, but you can see that uh, uh, in, a, in a patient uh, resisting to, uh, to CPI, the combination of both drugs was uh, really efficacious uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this patient. Then it's, uh, it's uh, uh, one of the way we may imagine to, uh, to, uh, to try to control uh, the, the tumor-associated macrophage and the tumor microenvironment in the future. We are here in Gustavo C. We are working to uh, different uh, types of uh, targets, and here it's just an illustration of the, the type of strategies we are developing here. Uh, Jean-Luc Perfettini is working on this uh, on this target and is developing very uh, innovative techniques uh, in this field. What about the myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cells that are also uh, present and uh, in the microenvironment? And we know that it's, uh, it is a strong actor of the uh, amine suppression. Then uh, we know that it's, uh, it's a major suppressor of the, uh, the amine system. It inhibits both the uh, adaptative, but also the innate amine responses. Uh, several mechanisms are involved, and uh, it's probably what makes very difficult to, to use this, uh, this pathway for the moment. Uh, we know that it's both linked to metabolic uh, mechanisms, we're supposed to state three uh, that inhibit the apoptosis of myeloid derived uh, cells to the uh, exosomes, the caspase recruitment domain uh, containing protein 9, the uh, exogenous co coagulation and tissue factor, and also uh, the uh, endoplasmic reticulum stress response. We can, you can uh, see on the right 
the, the, the different uh, therapeutic strategy that have been, uh, uh, that are uh, uh, currently explored. And you can see that some of the mechanisms are clearly uh, um, the same that uh, promotes the tumor associated macrophage. And uh, uh, it's why the, you can see that the, the, the drugs that uh, could be used uh, are, are the same, uh, probably because uh, the, the, all of these factors are influencing the different cells that are present in the tumor microenvironment. What about the fibroblasts? Uh, we know that fibroblasts are interacting with cancer cells uh, very largely. They are, they are protecting the, uh, the cells from, uh, all, from the immune cells, but also they could uh, uh, recruit some specific, cells, so, some specific cells in the microenvironment. And you can see on the right, the different mechanisms that are uh, explored to try to modulate the uh, uh, activity of the cancer-associated fibroblast based on the blocking the fibroblast recruitment and activations with a factor that you know, TGF-beta, FAC, FGFR, but also trying to shift uh, the balance between uh, the different fibroblast subpopulations and uh, trying to deplete the uh, immune uh, suppressive and tumor promoting uh, fibroblast. Uh, and uh, some uh, strategy are ongoing with CAR T cell uh, and uh, antibody drug conjugate especially. And uh, the third type of strategy is to try to block the uh, uh, immune suppressive and tumor promoting signaling from the fibroblast by uh, cytokines that you know, like uh, uh, vitamin D uh, receptor, CXCL12, CXCF4, TGF beta. You, you may uh, find the same uh, uh, cytokines in, uh, in various uh, environments. And, Unfortunately, I would say that uh, the results presented after I made this presentation during the, uh, the ASCO meeting, uh, based on the, the new generation of TGF beta inhibitors, are not uh, very encouraging on our capability to use this type of pathway in unselected uh, patient populations uh, in order to, uh, to overcome the CPI uh, uh, resistance. One of the potential uh, strategy to, uh, to overcome uh, uh, CPI resistance is maybe to use uh, intratumoral immunotherapy and uh, in being at the heart of the tumors. Why uh, human intratumoral immunotherapy may be interesting because you try to maximize the immune effects by uh, uh, the local priming and you try to uh, minimize uh, the, the systemic effect of the immunotherapy by uh, treating the patients uh, with at least one of the parts of the treatment just locally. Uh, we know that intratumoral immunotherapy uh, may activate or may influence the immunotherapy cycles in, uh, in many ways, uh, as it is uh, uh, exemplified on this uh, cartoon in a, in a review very recently published by Ignacio Melero. And um, uh, the uh, 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 intratumoral immunotherapy has, uh, has proven to be uh, interesting in some preclinical data, but also clinical data. I will show you an example. And here it was uh, one of the, I would say, uh, first study done uh, in clinical models uh, where there was a combination of uh, OX40 and CTLE4. And you can see that when the, the treatment was done uh, intratumorally, the activity was clearly better than uh, uh, given uh, intraperitoneously in this uh, mouse model. We are conducting in, uh, in Gustavo C this trial, the PRIMO trial. And uh, as you can see, patients are receiving uh, uh, an anti PD1 intravenously and a combination of TLR9 and CTLE4 uh, intra, uh, intratumorous, uh, by intratumoral injection. And I just exemplified the potentiality of this uh, treatment by uh, a case of one of my patients. It's a young woman, 56 year old, stage four adenocarcinoma very uh, sensitive for immunotherapy, I would say at least uh, biologically, PDL1 70%, ITMB value. She was, uh, the tumor was P53 mutated. She started in 2016, she was included in the IMPOA 150, but she received the combination of chemo and BEV. And then she received uh, many uh, immunotherapy, pembrolizumab, then she participated in a trial with nivolumab and an anti CD73. Then uh, an, uh, another, uh, uh, chemotherapy regimen and she progressed. And she was included in the, in the PRIMO trial. And as you can see uh, uh, between the baseline and after uh, two months of treatment, she had a very good response by the, uh, the combination of this intratumoral injection and the, uh, the, the PD-1 therapy. Then it's, uh, it's just to exemplify 
what could be possible with intratumoral treatment, but of course, it's just a preliminary and one case uh, of uh, this trial that is still ongoing. If we look at the different uh, um, activated trials, there are more than 100 activated trials worldwide. I'm sure that in the US, you should have uh, some of these trials activated with different types of, uh, of drugs. And I really believe that uh, in the future, we'll be able to, uh, to have more results with this kind of, uh, of techniques. And it will be uh, probably uh, an interesting way to try to overcome uh, uh, CPI resistance in our patients. The other strategies that are ongoing are based on uh, cellular therapy. Here is a design uh, uh, of, of a trial that's just to exemplify uh, uh, what we can do if we combine uh, immunotherapy and uh, uh, TIL infusion uh, followed by uh, IL-2. And you can see that in this study, uh, there was a sign of activity uh, when trying to combine this, uh, this uh, uh, to use this uh, cellular therapy. Yeah, you can see a quite uh, interesting results in this patient population, but however, it's, uh, it's not an easy uh, treatment to do, giving the treatment you have to, uh, to give to the patients in addition to the immunotherapy and the tips. Uh, the vaccines are also a way uh, to overcome the CPI resistance. Here, it's, uh, it's a study done not in patients resisting uh, to CPI, but the idea is to say that uh, it is possible, it may lead to, uh, to uh, very good results when combining these new antigen vaccines with uh, immunotherapy. And uh, what is interesting is that the, the transactional uh, uh, data presented uh, with these, uh, with these uh, results that clearly show that the activity, the cytotoxic activity was based on the, the, the epitopes uh, uh, that uh, uh, we are supposed to be targeted by the vaccines, then illustrating the fact that we may influence and uh, more specifically target the amino response in our patients. And then we represent a way to overcome the CPI resistance. Uh, finally, the drug repurpo repurposing uh, could be uh, an interesting way. Uh, uh, if you look at, uh, at the left, uh, you have all of these drugs that may represent, that may have an action on the uh, cells or the cytokines that are present in the tumor microenvironment. And I'm just uh, exemplifying your results that you are probably, you have seen probably uh, in, in uh, 2019 published in the JAMA Oncology. For those patients with uh, EGFM tumors who receive either EGFR TKI or EGFR TKI plus metformin, I have to say that I was quite surprised by the design of the study. But if we look at how metformin made uh, influence the microenvironment. It's uh, it's uh, there is a strong uh, uh, rationale, and I, I believe that uh, probably we have maybe to be uh, less skeptical regarding the the potential use of these drugs. Uh, of course, we have to uh, to to try to better understand how it how they works, how we can use it. But uh, I believe that uh, there is a way uh, to modulate the microenvironment by using this kind of uh, of drugs. And finally, a word about the tumor organismal microenvironment, then the, the factor that are located at the, uh, the distance of the, of the tumor, that, but that may influence it. Of course, uh, I have to talk about microbiota. You know the activity, uh, 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 the research in uh, Gustave Roussy by the team of Laurent Zilbogel, but those results have been presented by Lisa de Rosa. And you can see how uh, uh, Acamantia mucinifila uh, was related to the activity of uh, the immunotherapy, you can see on the left so regarding the response rate, 27 complete or partial response for uh, positive uh, acarmentia uh, microbiota compared to 17% when it, it was negative. And if we look at the, the rate of patients alive at uh, 12 months, you can see that it was clearly uh, greater in patients who were uh, acarmentia positive. And if we look on the right, uh, on how they found some uh, relationship between the, uh, uh, the, the presence of acarmentia and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the activity, or at least the, the presentation of the, uh, the tumor microenvironment, you can see that there were some uh, strong relationship, especially regarding the factors that influence the, uh, the immune response. And uh, I believe that, uh, of course, it will not be easy to manipulate this kind of uh, of uh, like to set up this kind of strategy, but we are launching a, a clinical trial in a CPI resistant uh, uh, patients. And I believe it's one of the way we may influence the tumor microenvironment by 
and modifi modificating the, uh, the microbiota. Then in conclusion, we can target the tumor microenvironment, uh, and there is a very strong rationale, at least biologically, uh, tumor uh, uh, microenvironment and tumor organismal environment have very complex relationships with the cancer cells and the tumor, and it's why it's probably so difficult to balance the, the benefit and probably to develop predictive factors, as it has been said by, by Suresh, and we have few clinical results specifically in the lung cancer fields uh, available to date. With that, I would like to thank all my friends here in, uh, in Gustave Roussy and uh, in Marseille for uh, working for, to the, on the Pioneer Trial and all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrice. So we can move to the discussion. Uh, I don't see any question from the floor, so I can start uh, to, to, to ask you some questions. So uh, also from the program, uh, we can see that there is a division between T cells and microenvironment. And clearly, in my opinion, this is weird because uh, there is a continuous crosstalk between the microenvironment uh, and the T cells. Uh, so, uh, and you have uh, also a very important position in your, in your hospitals. So maybe how can you run the strategy uh, for uh, the treatment? So we have seen from your presentations that uh, in 2021, we have at least 100 types uh, of uh, drugs in the pipelines. Uh, clearly how to overcome the resistance, uh, the primary and the secondary resistance uh, is a crucial point because also if we look at uh, the primary resistance on the long term, only 30% of patients uh, are alive after years. So how can we manage? And I started with Fabrice because you, I was impressed by your presentation with the pioneer. I always put your slides in my talk to say mm -hmm. that you have seen multiple targets and the end you come back again to the pdl1 and the pdl1 density and to the t cells so basically my idea is that uh, we are using a lot of uh, uh, drugs but without a, a biological background uh, a strong biological background and clearly we can't also uh, decide how to mix the, the drugs because we, we are not the owners of the pharma companies. So, so if we have an idea and we want to mix a T cell inhibitory to a microenvironment, whatever, we can't because we do not have the freedom. So uh, in this period, I feel just a bit confused on that situation. And also when I have to take the the, the uh, the, the, the drugs for my, my program is difficult uh, how to select. So how can you select? I started from Fabrice and then I go to Suresh for, uh, I think that this is more a strategical question. No, well, you're right, Marina. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, it's sometimes difficult to align, I would say the, the translational research and just how we try to understand the, the, the immune microenvironment and how it works and what we do in the clinical research, then even if we have large programs, usually we don't have the answer regarding the comprehensive analysis of the immune uh, microenvironment at the time we have to decide for the patient. And I think one of the first steps will probably be to try to set up uh, techniques, studies that allow us to collect tissue or to see into the blood or into the microbiota, the strongest factors that may explain the resistance, either primary or secondary, which are probably very different, very different mechanisms, and then uh, be able to adapt our strategy. The second point is, uh, I don't know what do you think, but I think that it's a uh, far more complicated than looking at just the genomics of the tumors. We have made those progresses in the past 15 years, but looking at the eye environment, trying to characterize it is so complicated because just of the number of actors, but also because probably of the dynamic changes uh, during the treatment, on treatment, and maybe influenced by factors we are even not able to identify for the moment. Then how we choose the drug, I would say that Probably uh, um, 
what is important is, uh, uh, I, I would say, to uh, align what we uh, know from the uh, from the the biology in our uh, uh, translational unit, and then to focus on, uh, I would say, quite limited number of uh, of um, uh, agents. Uh, and also to try to have uh, some uh, flagship programs uh, regarding the uh, what we believe. And you know that uh, I present to you the, the entra tumoral activity. Aurélien Marabel uh, is working uh, uh, in Gustave aussi. He will be in the US uh, next year in uh, Eastern for, the, for, for a few months. And uh, he's a real complete believer on the entra tumoral activity. We hope that he will be successful with this uh, strategy because it provides an original way to try to, to manipulate the environment. Then I would say globally, the choice is probably to be able to, uh, to, to comprehensively cover uh, from the translational to the clinical, the early phases programs, what you believe that will be the better target, but not have one uh, biological analysis on one side and one clinical drugs on the other side that you are not able to, uh, to try to understand all together. Suresh, the same question. <laughs> sure. No, thank you for that question, Marina. I think this is something we all struggle with in our institutions, right? There are so many of these exciting drugs that are coming by. And uh, some of the approaches we've taken are not very different from what Fabrice just pointed out to us. Uh, one is looking at your own institutional strengths in biology, uh, immunobiology. So we've been blessed to have some premier uh, top of the game uh, immunologists in our program. And we worked with their labs to see what are some of the approaches that they are pursuing in their lab and try and sync our clinical efforts with what's happening in the lab. So there is back and forth between the lab. For instance, our group has a strong interest in cytokines to use to stimulate the uh, immune T cell response. And now, so we like to have trials that align with that. So we can actually even as these trials are ongoing, do some biomarker work that aligns with what we've learned in the lab. So that has been helpful. The other approach we've taken is, given that these agents are being developed across a variety of tumor types, not just lung cancer, we look at what are the other disease groups in our institution working on and try to have some common themes across disease groups so that any biomarker translational work that we do across trials can focus on a specific strategy. For example, if we're working on 41BB, and if our best group is working on 41BB and our uh, you know, head and neck group is working on 41BB, it becomes easier to collect biosamples from across these and then start interrogating them uh, in a very methodical manner to understand. Uh, so those two approaches are what uh, we have adopted, but certainly looking at what's happening, what drugs are exciting when we see, for example, uh, some promising data from Tigit. Uh, we want our patients to have access to those as well. So then uh, we uh, have those trials that are more mature data-based and uh, are of interest to our patient population. And that also helps full the, uh, fill the portfolio with a group of trials that are more germane and where we can make a unique contribution to the Okay, and I have a question, a final question on, on this field, and then we can move to a question from the floor. So do you think that we have to integrate the artificial intelligence now in our labs to find maybe some pathways or some, uh, some complex systems that we are not able to understand just uh, uh, looking uh, with our eyes to the results, uh, or we are still too far from the artificial intelligence? No, I think the answer is we need to start utilizing these technological innovations into our biomarker discovery and research efforts. I think in cancer, the use of artificial intelligence is beginning to make its way. For instance, our pathology colleagues use that a lot. Uh, you know, in the in the past, when you have a patient with prostate cancer, the pathologist would use to count the cells and say, this is the Gleason score for a patient. Now a computer can do it because of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So uh, in uh, biomarker discovery, looking at uh, certain proteins, spatial orientation of proteins, single cell RNA approaches, these are all technological 
uh, advances that are available to us right now. And I think we need to work together, find out ways by which uh, these uh, novel technologies can help us understand complex uh, problems. Uh, really, our goal is personalized immunotherapy, right? We're not going to give the same drug to every patient, just like genomic-based treatment approaches. So understanding a patient's tumor environment at an individual level and adopting a treatment approach that's most likely to work is where we're going. And for that, I think these sort of technologies, especially artificial intelligence, is going to be very helpful. Yeah, I fully agree. And uh, clearly, it's a, it's a real powerful tool. You know, uh, uh, if we look at not only the pathological samples, but also the radiological samples, you know, the work did by done by uh, uh, Eric Dutch and uh, Roger Sun on the, the CT scan that and they were able to develop uh, uh, an analysis of the images that was able to predict uh, the activity of thymine checkpoints inhibitors. But uh, we, are, we are working now and uh, for the moment it's on breast cancers, but they, uh, we, have, uh, uh, we are uh, collaborating with, uh, with, a, with a company uh, uh, based in Gustave Roussy and they are looking at breast cancer samples, pathological samples. They were able clearly to identify without any other information patients who were responding to P3K inhibition without any other data very, very uh, nicely and strongly. Then I believe that at the end, and it's also what we shown in the, in the pioneer trial with a simple test, but I would say the machine will be probably more powerful and with more reproducibility that can do the pathologist worldwide. Even if we have the best pathologist uh, in the world in our institution, if we want to reproduce the results, we need probably to base some of our analysis on, uh, on IA. And I believe that it, it will provide you know, a signal and then we will be able to go back to the tumor identified by AE to understand what is behind the images and the analysis of the computer. But I'm sure that it would be a very important complement in our clinical trial. When we will set up clinical trial in the future, it will be, to my opinion, completely impossible not to collect uh, images in order to do IA, uh, pathological samples in order to do, uh, to do IA. I believe it will be really very, very important and provide maybe more rapidly that we are able to do with classical uh, research techniques uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the future. Yeah, I fully agree. I think that the future will be bad, uh, bad uh, bench, uh, artificial intel. There will be a triangle and not just uh, a monodirectional. So I move to a question. Sorry, but Marina, may, may oh, I pardon. add to it? Yes. Uh, because I think uh, we touched on a very important uh, issue that is, uh, as said by Suresh, we have to predict for a certain patient if he or she is going to respond. And I think we're a little bit getting uh, out of um, our the, the lead to, with all the new drugs, the, the, the same drugs that we're testing in, in groups of uh, patients, while we have to look at prediction. And I uh, think that what Fabrice said with the um, um, the microbiome is of great interest. We have volatile organic compounds that we can have in breath analysis and the I, IA. And I think that should really be uh, one of the top priorities. Yeah, I agree. But also the same Fabrice showed that he analyzed multiple targets and at the end he came back also to the T cells and to the PDL1. So I think that uh, it's very, it's very, I think that we are all on the same page, but uh, we are, uh, it, it's very difficult to find something different from the T cells uh, and the uh, PDL1 again. So this is why I was asking about the artificial intelligence system. So maybe there is something that we are not able to, to pick with our minds and uh, can come from a mathematical algorithm. So I just uh, ask a question, which is in my opinion is very important from the floor. So clearly when we think about the immunotherapy, we think about uh, the wild type population, 
But there is one part which is the patients with driver mutations that they potentially have a different microenvironment. And we know very well that they are not sensitive to the uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, and uh, so what about this? And what is, uh, uh, wh why is uh, we have toxicity after TKI and immune checkpoint uh, inhibitors? I think that this is a very fascinating area. So, because on one side we see that who respond, they, in general, they have autoimmunity, and it is possible that through the TKI we are generating autoimmunity. So, so how can we move to this field? So, maybe I start from Suresh that he made in the past an incredible work on. Uh, on EGFR mutations and uh, TKIs. Thank you, Marina. I think the tumor microenvironment of EGFR mutated patients is distinctly different. Uh, they have lower tumor mutation burden, their PDL1 expression levels are lower, and their environment is uh, less inflamed compared to tobacco carcinogen related lung cancers. And that explains why we don't see sufficient activity. They don't have enough new antigens that could be recognized by the immune system. And uh, we uh, have consistently seen trials of PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors as by monotherapy approach not show benefit. Uh, the question of what the toxicity related to the overlap of PD-1 inhibition and uh, TKI is fascinating. I don't know of a good explanation as to why that's been uh, seen. It's just not in EGFR, it's just not in lung cancer. We're seeing this across diseases. Uh, TKIs are not uh, easily combined with uh, PD-1 inhibitors. Uh, you know, even with KRAS G12C inhibition, we've seen uh, in clinicaltrials.gov number of trials ongoing for two years plus, but none of them have read out yet. So uh, it's just taking a long time to even come up with these combination approaches. Uh, to me, uh, that's a... That's, um, puzzle that needs to be sorted out as to why these treatments don't work in a never smoker or a genomically simple tumor. There we have some explanations. Yeah, I agree. Fabrice? Yeah, nothing specific to that. I think uh, we know probably the, um, at least I would say one of the piece of the microenvironment that is quite specific in EGFM patients is probably VGFR. We know that there are some, we have those clinical work, but we know that the biology is clearly highlighting the role of VGF in this tumor type. Um, <clears throat> after that, uh, we have some of the patients that are responding to CPI, then uh, we have also to understand uh, why. And uh, you know, it's also something I wanted to highlight. Uh, it's, uh, and you are closest to the, the biggest company in the US, then it's also important to try to to push them to, uh, to, to analyze more deeply both the positive but also the negative trials in order to better understand. And I think we, we can derive more information uh, from all the trials that are conducted worldwide. Uh, regarding the EGF and the, and the toxicity, it's, it's the same. It's, it's at the end quite a rare uh, event and uh, probably uh, something that uh, is influenced by, uh, I would say, uh, maybe more systemic uh, characteristics than uh, I would say uh, local molecular alteration. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. Paul, would you like to comment uh, on that or? <laughs> I see you're connected and I exploit uh, your presence. <laughs> no, uh, I think I have not much to, to add to that. Uh, and uh, to be honest, I, I was doing something I should not do uh, apping during uh, during the meeting so <laughs> so um, so i think that we can conclude this session i i think that we have a lot of food for thoughts for maybe the next five years <laughs> and uh, it was really my privilege to chair both both suresh and fabrice and uh, i think that uh, i can give the word to uh, lucio crino again he will uh, um, be the chair of the next session instead of uh, Lorenzo Spaggiari. And uh, I think that uh, if there are no other questions, I don't think uh, 
there are other questions from the chat, we can move to the next session. And I would like to thank you again for your presence and for your incredible presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.